we're talking about what we believe. And tonight, last week we kind of found these four corners, you know, of our building, of the basement, the foundation of our building. And they helped us to understand what it is as believers. Now, I, I don't know about uh, those who are not evangelical. I, I want to say mainline, but there is some overlap there. But, but there are people, like when I got in church when I was eight years old, we came into a Disciples of Christ church. And so salvation was not by faith alone. Salvation was by baptism in water. You were not declared saved until you were baptized in water. Now, is there scripture for that? Well, yeah, kind of. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And so that was their, their bedrock. That was the corner. And then we had communion every Sunday. Because as often as you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. So if we gathered and we didn't have communion, we had failed God. Now, for us in the evangelical world, we... <laughs> And I've been telling you that I'm not sure we're in the same camp, but the, the corners of our building have to do with Jesus Christ being accessible by faith. Now, the disciples of Christ and others who believe in baptism for salvation would not say that that's a work. They would say that's obedience. And you're not working to earn your salvation. You're obeying Jesus who gives the salvation. But for us, we think no matter where you are, geographically, you should be able to call out on the name of Jesus and be saved instantly and in that location. All right, That's a cornerstone. But tonight we're going to talk about where, where our walls go up and our walls are kind of different. So maybe you think of us within all of Christianity, we're one of the rooms. We, we have four walls, but they belong kind of to us doctrinally, okay? And that's what we're going to look at tonight. And I, I took you last week through the New Testament, the Gospels, with the first words that Jesus said. We're going to do the same thing tonight with the Holy Spirit. Now, interestingly enough, he shows up before Jesus does in each of the Gospels. The Holy Spirit shows up before Jesus does. If you think about it, he shows up in Genesis, well, whether he shows up before Jesus or not, because the Father says, let us make man in our own image. But yet the Holy Spirit is there over the face of the deep. So this is kind of a theme that we see. And I believe when you catch these kinds of things, then you begin to see not just what's written, but what God is intending by where it's placed. The importance, the value. So tonight, when we see the Holy Spirit showing up, before Jesus in each of the Gospels, there's something of importance there. Right? Our aim is to identify our similarities with evangelicals and more importantly, our differences. So we move now to the what of those. In our previous study, we reviewed the first words of the Lord Jesus in each Gospel to do, discover those four corners. To clearly see our walls, let's use the same approach. I believe it's self-evident that the Pentecostal tribe is Holy Spirit-centric. I think you would agree, right? It's, it's self-evident in that title. We're Pentecostal. And that doesn't refer to anything but the day of Pentecost. It doesn't refer to the Old Testament. It doesn't refer to that feast. I know that's when the day took place, but that's not what it refers to. It refers to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When we say we are Pentecostal, that's the reference. And in Acts chapter 2, it says in the King James, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the believers were gathered together. Right? All right. So it's a reference to that text. And on that day, they were filled with or baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, again, spirit is what we're using, but the King James, more often than not, uses the word ghost in those texts in the New, New King, or excuse me, in the King James New Testament, the Holy Ghost. They are interchangeable. The King James also uses Holy Spirit. But um, rarely do we see Holy Ghost used in the modern translations, and that's fine. I, I don't see a big issue here or there. All right, so our second look at the things we believe is a look at manifestations slash ministry. As believers, what is it that we hope is manifested in our daily life? What is it that we want others to see? 
This is a question we don't ask ourselves often enough. What is it that we want others to see in us? And this is your opportunity to answer. Notice I have blanks on the paper there for you, and they'll show up up there at some point probably too. What do we want others to see? First, to make a day. Dave, when you're working at Walmart and people go to Walmart, why do they go to Walmart? There are products inside that building that they need. Now, for some, like Pastor Martin Lease, that's not the case. They just go to McDonald's to talk to people. But for the most part, right? I'm going to pick on him, he's not here. Oh, McDonald's is closed. All right. People go to Walmart because there are products there. When you think about your life as a believer, your faith, my faith, that's supposed to dominate everything. My worldview is shaped by the fact that I know Jesus Christ. My relationships are shaped. My culture, my, my personal culture, the things I do and don't do, all of that's shaped by Jesus. What do I intend for others to see? Jesus. Sure. Yeah, that's, that is the answer. What else? What else? Specifically within that. Love. Kindness. Kindness. Yep. Trust. Yeah. Hold on just a second, Dave. That we want them, Brother Harold, to see that we trust God or that they can trust us. Okay. Yeah, okay. Terrific. We trust God and they can too. The fruit of the Spirit. Brother Dave? Yeah, to, we, we want them to, to witness a, we, we want to witness to them, but we want them to witness a true relationship. And then I would also add, because of where we're going tonight, we want them to see the Holy Spirit at work. And, and Brother Steve mentioned the fruit, yes, because I don't want us just to talk about the gifts. Those who are not from a Pentecostal background, church, experience, doctrine, theology, whatever, they're going to say, well, people need to see the fruit. They don't want to see all that extremism, and they don't want to just hear about an experience. They need to be touched by your kindness and generosity, your gentleness and self-control. Okay, and that's not to be discounted. Uh, but we also want to talk about the other things. So they need to see, we want them to see, that we have had an experience with the Holy Spirit. Why? Why do we want people to see all of these things in us? So they want what we have. It goes right back to where I started tonight, just with the little in introduction with um, Dr. Paul I, Brother Ken Gobb. We want them to know Jesus. Right? We want them to know Jesus. Before he speaks in each of the Gospels, we're introduced to the Holy Spirit. Think of what that means, the importance God places on the presence of his Spirit in the world. What we need to know then is this. What is expected of us, of us in relation to the Spirit? Immediately after Matthew finishes the genealogy, so go to Matthew chapter 1. Okay, now notice there in verse 1, this is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah. Now notice in verse 17, all those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David. And so I want you to see that what he writes first is the genealogy of Jesus. It's very Jewish. The concept is, okay, I want you to know this guy, and you'll know him based on who he came from. All right? The moment that's done, now we go to verse 18. This is our text. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're told about Jesus. We're told how he got here. In other words, at this point, Matthew realizes everybody's looking back. But Jesus has not yet spoken. He's not yet here. But we know the Holy Spirit is at work, right? And that's important. Doctrinally, that's very important. That it all begins with the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, It's possible to read this and determine that this was some special work reserved only for a precious few, such as Mary. But when we read his next text concerning the Spirit in 311, who do we find him speaking to? He's quoting John the Baptist, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. (laughs) Praise God. When I was in Bible college, I'm going to tell you what. You had to know that verse. This really is one of the premier verses. It's... It's the cornerstone of the cornerstones for us as Pentecostals because this describes the fact as believers, we're to be looking forward to it, we're to experience it, but that it's a promise from Jesus the Messiah. It's an experience that he wants to give to all who call on his name. So here's my question now. Who is he speaking to? Who's John the Baptist speaking to? We know who he's speaking about, Jesus. Who's he speaking to? John literally, his followers, by extension, every believer. Amen? Every believer. So this is how Jesus is introduced. You know him because of all of these fathers of his, as far as genealogically. But you don't know him as to his origin. He's being brought here by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by the introduction of the Holy Spirit, not by the description of the Holy Spirit, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this is another point the New Testament makes. It's all, often those two go together, power and Holy Spirit. Power. If you have a uh, Bible app, and I'm going to let you into some of the inner workings of preaching here, but if you have a Bible app, most of them will allow you to do searches not just of an individual word, but of a phrase. Now, the artificial intelligence it uses, it will find that phrase even if it's separated by multiple other words in the verse. So let's say you look up power, Holy Spirit. You're going to find 180 verses in the New Testament, but not all of them mean what you want it to. It can be power. Uh, The devil showed his great power and the Holy Spirit came and contended against him. And that's not really what you're looking for, but you understand what I'm saying? The artificial intelligence brought that together. What you are looking for are places just like this in verse 18. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of of the Holy Spirit. Now that's a theme. Matthew writes one book, but that phrase, brothers and sisters, is a theme all the way through to the end of Revelation. The power of the Holy Spirit. You almost never see that, the power of the Father, the power of God, but you see the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Now, because we go to the light switch and turn it on, lights pop on, and we set the thermostat and the furnace comes on, we forget how valuable this is. It's, 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 I pray almost every day, God, don't, in America, don't take us to a place where we are able to be reminded of how valuable this is. Don't think he can. Did you read that part? When all the, before Moses even went back to the children of Israel to tell them, I'm here to lead you out, God said to him, I'm going to bring them out through you and I'm going to turn the hearts of the Egyptians, their captors, I'm going to change their hearts and they're going to give gold and silver and clothes over to my people. And, And in that manner, I am going to plunder the Egyptians. Before Moses ever went back to them, God said, I'm going to do it. Don't you think he can't change? all of our circumstances in America at one point. Yeah, he can. He can turn the big switch off, and that's it for electricity. So, you know, I pray all the time. Oh, God. Jesus said, pray that your flight's not in the winter, you're not on a Sabbath, and you're not with a child. Now, I know, in my opinion, that's written to the Jewish people about fleeing Jerusalem and all that, but I think it's pretty wise for us to pray however Jesus tells us to pray. He said, you need to pray this way. So I do it. Praise God. Okay, are you seeing what I see? Does anybody have a comment you want to make at this point? Because I'm on a roll here and I may not get shut down. (laughs)
I'm doing good. Oh, hallelujah. That beautiful woman up front said, keep going. Okay, so who's he speaking to? To all of us. I gave you a lot of room there. But he's speaking to believers of all generations. He's speaking to anybody who recognizes who this guy is, the Messiah. When you recognize that, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, we're not going to take time tonight to understand what the part of baptism means and the with fire and all of that. But... um, We'll do that eventually. For Pentecostals, this is intended to represent both doctrine as well as experience. And therein, of course, is the challenge. Everything about us is intended to be oriented around a personal experience more than a doctrine. From this experience, we believe the word is saying, will come a belief system. In other words, our foundation. Out from our baptism will flow an understanding of and implementing of the word. Now, there are places where you might want to put comments, or excuse me, commas in my text. I didn't separate all my phrases, and I did that intentionally, but you might want to. And I did not have this spell checked by Sister Kim, because her and Trudy are from the same generation as me, and there are never enough commas in what you're writing. But then when I read stuff from younger people, no commas, no semicolons, none of that. Matter of fact, they don't even use periods or exclamation points when they're texting. No punctuation. I'm telling you, the devil has vomited it right out of hell. (laughs) Okay, page two. I forgot to print these front and back, so you have a second page there. Mark, do you know where we're headed now? Mark quickly helps us to see this reality. He follows his description of what John saw, so go to Mark. Or did you do that already? Mark chapter 1 and look at verse 10. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. Now, he has done the same thing as Matthew, quoting John the Baptist in verse 8. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Because you might be saying, well, Pastor, the Holy Spirit came after Jesus there, but Mark had already introduced him. I just didn't grab it for you, okay? So in verse 10, he follows that with this in verse 12. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. Nothing could be more clear and colorful for Pentecostals, not so much in what it was that Jesus was to do, but more so in Mark's words, compelled to go. The Spirit compelled him to go. To go. What does that say to us? What's that? What does that represent for us? What do you see there? Motivation. Motivation? Absolutely. Yep. What else? The Spirit's going to lead us into a place of of obedience, following Jesus, and it's not going to be detrimental. Now, be careful with that. One of the reasons I like to bring Dr. Paul in is because I want your kids to meet somebody like that. Nobody is going to introduce them to that kind of a guy in the public school system of America. It's not going to happen. Nobody in most mega prosperity, faith now churches is going to have him anywhere within 10 miles of their church. But I want somebody like that to say, after I got off that boat, came back, if you didn't hear him tell the story, you can watch it there from the Sunday morning service. The next night I was arrested and put in jail and then he showed us somebody sitting there on a concrete cell slab with their feet over a bar and then the, the loops around and the bar through. And, and you, you heard him say, for just a moment, I almost was discouraged. Well, right there, I'm, I'm out of the picture, right? <laughs> because I know how I feel in that situation. Oh, I can only imagine. But... Um, I want your kids, your young adults, to be connected to somebody who has felt like Jesus is worth that. I don't want them just seeing Joel Osteen and and whoever and saying, well, yeah, Jesus is worth that. Sure, yeah, sign me up, right? Sign me up, man. If we get to go uh, to the best housing development and drive the, you know, two, three million dollar car, I don't know if he does or not, but I'm just anybody, you know, anybody with success and, and all of that, 
And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I want them to also know people who have paid a price to love Jesus. I want them to hear from somebody who said, I almost became discouraged, and then the Holy Spirit spoke audibly to me. And so the importance that I place on that cannot even be measured. But when we say that he won't, the Holy Spirit won't lead us into detrimental places, what we mean is they won't be detrimental to our faith. They might be detrimental to our body, our pride, our ego. They might be detrimental to our circumstances, our situation. Now, I don't know that I could go through what Dr. Paul went through, but God never asked me to. But I'm going through what he's asked me to go through. Amen? So it's the same faith. And that's what I want your kids to see, your sons and daughters and your grandchildren. I want them to see that when God, when the Holy Spirit compels you to go, you're going to be able to go because he's going to give you the ambition, the motivation, the drive. He's also going to give you the sense that you're doing this because you love Jesus. And he's going to make sure that you know it's worth it. It's worth it. Amen. So, what does this say to us? It says that the Holy Spirit will compel us. He compels us to go. He doesn't compel us to stay. Now, going doesn't mean leaving our city. Going just simply means going to people, going to lost people, going to hurting people, going to broken people, some who are in our church and just encouraging them, some who are not in the kingdom yet, but just going. That's the Holy Spirit's business. He'll compel us to go. Amen? All right. Luke. Luke chapter 1. We're not going to read all of these, but you know them. In Luke, we find an even earlier work of the Spirit, as Zechariah is promised that his son will be filled even before his birth, but not at his conception. Notice that distinction. The angel has shown up to Joseph already, and here in Luke will show up to Mary. He is now, prior to that, showing up to Zechariah. To Joseph and Mary, he is very clear. The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, is what is going to produce conception. But for John, no, that's not the case. But before he is born, the Holy Spirit will visit him. So that means he received the Holy Spirit at about... Six months in vitro. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Hey, how old were you when you had an encounter with the Holy Spirit? Well, I was negative three months. <laughs> you were what? I was negative three months. Well, that's not possible. Oh, yes, it is. So here's the other part I find amazing. The number of references our brother has to the Holy Spirit, and by that I mean Luke. I don't know if you caught that little little deal there that I did. The number of references our brother has to the Holy Spirit in the incarnation story are staggering. Chapter 1, verse 15, 35, 41, 67, chapter 2, 25, and 27. Those individuals specifically listed as being filled with the Spirit is no less significant. Elizabeth in 1 and 41, check that out. This is what the Bible says. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you not assume also that John was filled at that moment? I think it would be a safe assumption. We can't make the assumption because the Bible doesn't say that. But it says he would be filled in his mother's womb. He is in his mother's womb, and she's filled. Nevertheless, that's all we know. Here's the next one, Zechariah in verse 67. Then his father, (laughs) Zechariah, you remember him, right? The last time we saw him, he couldn't even talk. Zechariah, the guy who really didn't demonstrate much obedience, contended with the angel. What do you mean I'm going to have a child in my old age? Who are you talking to? And Gabriel said, what? I stand in the very presence of God I'm holding back right now from killing you and about three million other people around you who do you think you're talking to I'll tell you what you're not going to talk until the baby shows up even he in verse 67 
his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. And then one more, having the Spirit upon him, chapter 2, verse 25. At that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was a righteous and and he was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, I find that interesting because there's a transition taking place here. And the Bible wants us to see that. And that transition has to do with the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. All right? So, who is under the Old Covenant? Well, all of these people, right? But, even though the New Covenant has not yet been instituted, Jesus has come on the scene. And now the terminology changes. So we saw John and his family filled with the Holy Spirit under the context of the Old Testament. But Jesus has arrived, and now Simeon is described for us as having the Holy Spirit upon him. Now I'm playing a little bit here. I'm getting really close to the nub, and I'm, I'm splitting hairs. But I want you to see this because I think the Bible's saying something for us. I understand that the New Covenant, the New Testament, the blood of Jesus has not yet been shed, the New Testament not yet fully realized or implemented. But you would agree with me, right, that John the Baptist closes out the Old Testament. So there's a play here that I think the Holy Spirit is showing us as Luke writes, and the guys who are associated with John, who represents the Old Testament and the closing of the Old Testament, are filled with the Holy Spirit, But Luke, writing from years later, knows about the upper room. He knows about Pentecost. And so when Simeon comes to grab the baby, what we find out is from Jesus on until Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is on them. He doesn't want us thinking about them being filled because we're about to see a new concept of what being filled with the Holy Spirit means. Do you understand? Let me show it to you a little more personally or in a a little more specifically. Our same brother, Dr. Luke, reserves Mary's experience with the Holy Spirit for Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. She's listed with them in the upper room. She's not spoken of as having been filled with the Holy Spirit during the announcement and the incarnation. The Holy Spirit has come upon her, and the power of the Holy Spirit has caused her to be expectant, but Luke is careful not to show her as being filled with the Holy Spirit twice. Do you see what I'm saying? He doesn't want us to see both the Old Testament experience and the New Testament as synonymous and as happening interchangeably. There's a clear line of demarcation. Those associated with the family that represents the closing of the Old Testament, John, all of them have an experience with the Holy Spirit that is reminiscent of David and Samson and others. But when it comes to Mary, who is associated with the New Testament directly... (laughs) who's associated with the one who is the New Testament, now she comes in to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the one who had the power of the Holy Spirit come upon her. The way she is presented to us as having experienced the Holy Spirit is Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. Thank you. I love this woman. She saw it. I'm going to go through it again because some of you are, I get it. It took me a while to get it as well. But there's a profound focus on what happens in Acts chapter 2 for the church. Profound. It cannot be overemphasized. It cannot be minimized without destroying the church. And so whenever the church begins to to rise up in Pentecost, immediately the forces, several different forces begin to oppose that. Obviously, the forces of Satan, demonic spirits begin any time there's a move of God, a revival, an outpouring, a breakout of spiritual things and gifts of the Spirit, there's always going to be a demonic assault. You can read it all through history. But there's also an assault 
from within the church among those who don't want that, who are not uh, engaging, who are poo-pooing it or, or saying, no way, and that's not for today, and not all passed away with the last apostle. I had an apostle here last Sunday. I don't know when the last one, who they're referring to as the last one. but And so the Holy Spirit, and by this I mean as authoring the New Testament, he makes sure that everybody's attention for all the church age is directed over and over and over to the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And the New Covenant cannot be separated from the baptism in the Holy Spirit. John said, I can't even... His dad said, I don't know who you think you are to the angel of God. But this is what John said about the one coming. I'm not even worthy to kneel down and untie his shoe. Uh, even if I laid in the dust, even if you put hot coals on my back, even if you put scorpions up and down my legs, even if you cut my legs off or cut my tongue out, I'm not worthy to untie his shoe, but he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's what John said. And so from that declaration all the way through until Jesus returns, the focus is on the church with the Holy Spirit. I can prove it. The last thing the Holy Spirit says with the bride, the church, even so, come Lord Jesus. So the focus for us has to be on that. And God, the Holy Spirit, shows us that because everybody associated with John has the infilling of the Holy Spirit under the Old Covenant, under the auspices of the Old Covenant. But everybody associated with Jesus has it. If anybody was going to be described by Luke as having been filled by the Holy Spirit early on, it would be Mary, right? If anybody. John would... I'm sorry, Zechariah wouldn't even acknowledge <laughs> that he was being talked to by an angel of God. And yet he got to be filled with the Holy Spirit under the, the description, the, the in inference of the Old Testament. But here comes the New Testament, and Mary. Now, you can just turn there real quick. We're not, eh, we're almost out of time. Go to, Acts, go to Acts chapter 1 real quick and just check this out. Here are the names. I'm in verse um, 13. Here are the names of those who were present. This is the upstairs or upper room. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer along with Mary, the mother of Jesus several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, 2, 1, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Who? Yeah, all the believers. So you can, you can know. You don't have to assume. Luke says, listen, I'm not writing them out again. It's them. All those believers. All. Not a few of them. Not some are missing like Thomas. No, they're all here. Because the risen Lord has said to them, stay in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. Not only are the 12 apostles, or 11 apostles plus Matthias, the 12 there, but they also have the brothers of Jesus. Now, that's a big point because when Jesus is in ministry, they're not too sure he's who he says he is. But now they know he's who he says he is. And Mary's there. Not any of the other Marys listed in the New Testament. That Mary. I'm, I'm somewhere else right now. That Mary. The mother. I know Mary Magdalene. I know Mary uh, James, Cleopas, mother of James and John, Mary, and this Mary, that Mary, every which Mary. But I'm telling you which Mary it is so you don't have any confusion. It's Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then he comes to chapter 2. Well, you know, he didn't write in chapters, but on the day of Pentecost, all of those believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Two signs. The wind, but the wind didn't affect them. The wind seemed to have either opened the doors or allowed them to know that it was the Holy Spirit coming. But the two things that happened to them, tongues of fire and tongues of language. The tongues of fire were never repeated. The wind was never repeated in the New Testament, in the written New Testament. 
it seems to say to you and I that the wind came to the church and never left. The tongues of fire seem to be that place where the Holy Spirit, like a spark plug. I don't know if you have seen a spark plug, but there's the glass bottom part, and then this little L-shaped filament comes up of metal. And then the fire flies between that tip and the glass part. And that fire is what ignites the combustion in your engine. And that fire is there whenever the ignition is on. But just because the fire isn't there doesn't mean the spark plug is not good or has quit working. And that seems to be the picture here that the fire is indicative that the Holy Spirit has connected to the church. That one is never repeated. It doesn't seem to need to be repeated. What is repeated over and over in the book of Acts? The tongues of languages. Because as James pointed out, the tongue, the human tongue, is a a fire. Who can control it? It's a a mighty, mighty ship being turned by the rudder. And so you and I need to understand that the Holy Spirit falls in the New Testament on the church so that he can bring the power to the church. Okay, one last thing. Our fourth wall in John completes the structure and brings us back around to the promise we saw in Matthew. And this is from John 1.33, the second half. The one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? The Gospels begin with this imperative and they close out. Matthew captures it and John captures it. Mark does as well, but I'm using the first and the last. Isn't that phenomenal? Luke actually references it as well. That's how profound they felt the words of John the Baptist were. That all Tell me something else that all four of them present to us together other than the crucifixion, resurrection. But the message of John the Baptist, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, how does this apply to you? Five minutes. How does this apply to you? Pam? (laughs) We're having our own church service up here. Hmm. Right. Yeah, it's my, most of you know, it's my position that Mary is, she becomes expectant when Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. That at that moment, three things happen. Elizabeth is filled, John is filled, and Mary becomes pregnant. Because Elizabeth looks at her then and says, what's the mother of my Lord doing here? At that moment. Yeah. Didn't you read my book? Yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Why wouldn't, this is my point in the book, why wouldn't God want us to see when the Son of the living God came into the world? Why would He hide that from us? He would not. There's just no way. And it's, it, there isn't any other atmosphere in which you would say, oh, you know, th- this is it. But the two ladies have that moment. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit is just present. I, I mean, first, Elizabeth just pow, that, that statement that she makes. But then Mary follows it up. You know the Holy Spirit has come upon her. When you read what she wrote uh, or what she says... And it's so powerful that 35, no, 45 years later, when Luke is doing this research and he asks her, she can still remember it word for word. I assume that's where he got it. Could she have told others, and they tell Luke, 
possibly, but it's most likely that Luke is doing that research and Mary is in her 70s or 80s at this point. Oh, yeah. Would, would I like to have been there? Yeah, I would. Yes. 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 The difference between the Old Testament, among many, the Old Testament church and the New Testament church is that the Holy Spirit was given selectively. Moses, remember when it's, isn't it Joshua that says, hey Moses, those other two guys are prophesying, make them stop. Moses said, oh, would to God that all of his people were prophets because God had taken the spirit that was on Moses and put on the 70. But in the New Testament, it's not limited to just certain vessels of distinction or certain vessels to help continue the story of Israel's deliverance. The church is the vessel that Jesus wants now to empower and to use. So what's the key? What, what, what is the key for us? The key is desire, hunger, and thirst. The key is getting with God and, and being there. And Dr. Paul, this is something else that I try to make sure that people coming in here highlight. And he talked about that Saturday night. He had two points. Number one, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I ask myself all the time as a pastor, is it necessary for everybody? Or is it just you know, helpful for those of us in ministry? And I come back and back to the thing that it's helpful for everybody. And we'll talk maybe some next week about why. Okay? This gives us access to the manifestation and ministry, not of us, but of the Holy Spirit. This, this baptism, this experience. Evangelicals criticize us as being too focused on and preoccupied with being spirit-filled individually. But having read the gospel text in the order I gave them to you tonight, do you think we're too occupied with being spirit-filled? Yeah, it's what I just did with you. It's un, when you look at it that way, it is undeniable that God intends for the Holy Spirit to be the prominent part of his church. And, and I'm not talking about any particular role of the Holy Spirit or experience with him. I'm just saying that there, without the Holy Spirit, there's no church. Now, evangelicals will not deny that. They'll not disagree with us. And the mainline people, mo most of them, will not. But what we then begin to talk about is what's captured in Acts chapter 1 and 8. The evangelicals quote Acts 2.21, I gave you that last week, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They quote it as a form of experiential doctrinal declaration. And Pentecostals quote Acts chapter 1.8, Jesus said, you shall receive power, you shall be my witnesses. After the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall receive power, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And that, for us, is bedrock. Uh, just as others see a need to experience the salvation spoken of in 2.21 before inviting others, Pentecostals encourage every believer to experience the power of the Spirit so that they can effectively invite others. Years ago, when Sister Pam and I were at the church in Silver Spring, Maryland, the Seventh-day Adventists down there are very strong in that area, and they have a number of schools, private Christian schools, and these are highly regarded Christian schools. They charge $20,000 a year for your kid to go there. Not my kid, but your kid. And um, they, they compete you know, with other big schools, both private and public. And, um, oh, you know, senators have their kids there. And uh, You've often heard of the presidents. They put their kids in that friend's school there, right? And this is somewhat the same. And one day I got a call from the Seventh-day Adventist excuse me, Christian school down the street, and they asked me, would you come and speak, the one teacher, would you speak to my class about the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I said, listen, do you, you know what church you called, right? Yep, I called the Assembly of God. And he said, my background, I have some experience in the Assemblies of God, and, and I respect your position, your doctrine, and I, I'd just like you to come and tell, teach my kids. I teach the Bible and history class, and I want you to come in. I said, okay, what do I, I have two classes, 
And I want you to do two sessions with each of them. The one is ninth graders and the other is 11th graders. And so you'll have about 45 minutes and I want you to let them ask questions. So in those two classes, that's what I did. I, I walked them. I wish I hadn't seen what I did for you tonight. But um, walk them through. And he said at the end, one of the kids had a question, and the teacher said, you need to understand that he and his church look at the Holy Spirit like we look at the Sabbath. It, it's, it's the focus of what we see God doing among us. I thought that was cool, you know. I, what was really neat was I, was I had a Saturday night service at that time, and they said, some of the kids said, why do you go to church on Sunday? I said, well, I go on Saturday, Saturday and Sunday both. And that really disarmed them because they saw that I had respect for church on Saturday. Now, we did it after sundown. I didn't tell them that. But, um, the, the, you know, I understand their point, but it's not quite the same. Keeping Sabbath and experiencing the Holy Spirit are not the same. Uh, being water baptized and experiencing the Holy Spirit are not the same. I'm going back to what I, from 8 to 16, what I grew up with. Being, having communion every week, you receive it, you, you, at your seat you receive it, or you go forward and they give you the emblems or the elements of communion. That, that and the experience of the Holy Spirit are not the same. Those things are all important and they're doctrinal, but this is experiential. God is inviting us into an experience with himself. Questions or comments? Uh, Brother Bob, I would. I would consider one to be a discipline or an act of obedience. And that's kind of synonymous, I think. But absolutely, yes, I would. And there are other New Testament acts of obedience that we are asked to demonstrate, uh, all of us, all believers. All right. Yes, Brother Mandela. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. Be okay, for me personally, I was old enough at 16 when I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit that I remember some of my years in faith prior to that. All right? Uh, Sister Pam was in a Pentecostal church from the time basically she was born, and I wasn't, not until I was 16. So I have, I have a little bit of a framework there from which I can say, oh, here's what was happening to me or others around me. But second of all, I think you're absolutely right that part of what allows the Holy Spirit to do more in us, to have, for us to have an experience with him, for, him to, for us to be baptized in him, is that we begin to give him credit. One of the things that grieves me, and I think grieves a lot of other Pentecostals about evangelicals who don't have an experience with the Holy Spirit, is because they fear being like us. They fear being in, in, let me tell you where this happens, in seminary. They fear being criticized as being too exuberant, too, um, uh, not zealous, but too emotional. 
And so they retreat thinking they're retreating from us. But what they're retreating from is the Holy Spirit. And part of what allows you to get comfortable, part of what allows you to become hungry and desperate is that you're beginning to see the Holy Spirit. You're beginning to seek and see. You're beginning to recognize him and thank him. I went to a Pentecostal church when I was younger. We were in, I forget what grade, and my friend's cousin, he was a friend of ours as well, but my best friend's cousin was diagnosed with leukemia. And they attended a Pentecostal church, not like us, not a kind of a, uh, a fairly moderate Pentecostal church. They attended a little radical Pentecostal church, radical. If there weren't people, they didn't handle snakes, but the first time I went there, I expected that we were going to. Okay, that's I don't know if you can imagine that kind of church, but that's what it was. And they had a missionary evangelist there from Haiti. Brother Dallas Plemons was his name. And I remember the night he prayed for Carl. And this is what he said. We were in ninth grade. So this was the first time I'd ever been in a Pentecostal church. And it's a three or four night revival and ended up going two weeks. And I was there almost every night mesmerized. But this is I'll never forget what he said. You're healed. Jesus just healed you. But. You do everything the doctors tell you, and you make sure you give the Lord the praise. Carl's still alive today, and at that point his diagnosis was not very good. But I did not have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I can tell you that every night at the altar time, I I wrestled and fought with my experience in church, what I was used to and what I was seeing. And I was trying to reconcile them, but this is what did happen. I began to be familiar with the setting. I began to say, there's something there. I don't understand it, and that I didn't like, and I don't know what that is, and that made me feel crazy. And I'm not sure that person even knew the Lord, let alone to be doing what they were doing. But something there bore witness with the part of me that knows God. And all of that then allowed me two years later to very naturally walk into an experience with the Holy Spirit. So I think you're absolutely right. I think too many evangelicals, and you can see a little bit of this in, um, in a wonderful book by um, uh, oh, pastor out, at, um, out in California, uh, Foursquare, was on TV for many years, Pat, Jack Hayford, thank you. Uh, pastor Jack Hayford's book on tongues, and he pre- preached to a Baptist convention of 10,000. They asked him to come and preach on Pentecost, specifically on tongues. We did the study of the book here 15, 18 years ago. But in that, he talks about how that whole organization was beginning to ask questions about the Holy Spirit. That has to happen. So if you haven't had a personal experience or encounter that you would say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Spirit, it begins with, just like tonight, just beginning to say, Holy Spirit, something he's saying is is connecting with something inside of me. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm telling you something. Sister Pam and I are praying, many of you are praying, and God in 2021, God is going to do something in our church. Something is going to happen that repositions us. I today got, got excited yesterday and today and, and just for no explanation except that I know God is getting ready to do something. Amen. All right, I've kept you too long. Oh, Sister Jane, go ahead. Amen. 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 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Just confirmation. I don't see all of that yet, but I feel it. Amen. I, uh, I'd like to talk a lot more about that, and maybe that's, we'll do some of that next week, okay? Because we, we need to delve into that. What happened? I told you tonight that the flesh, not only the devil, but the flesh will work. And when that charismatic outpouring took place in the late 60s and 70s, and mainline, main, mainline people started be, being filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, seeing miracles and, and praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, eventually they either had to leave those churches or they kind of shrunk back in to the doctrine of that church because the flesh. Ishmael always, always persecutes Isaac, always. Stand with me tonight. We're going to ask Sister Pam to pray for our country tonight. We pray God's blessing on former President Donald Trump. We thank God that he was willing to be president, just like we thank God that uh, President Bush, President Obama, I'm maybe leaving people out, you know, all of them. Listen, there's only been 40 however many. And um, I could not imagine even wanting to be in that position. And the, the attacks that you would take no matter what. We thank God for former President Trump and pray blessings on him. And we thank God for President Biden and pray blessings on him. Go ahead.